to, to church as we continue to commemorate uh, those servicemen uh, who died in the conflict of World War I. I'm so appreciative of James and all the research that he has been doing as he continues to uh, to um, do unfold and reveal and uh, help us to know the person behind the name and we're remembering today. So thank you, James. Uh, thank you very much, everyone, for coming today to the commemoration for William Henry Gudgeon. Uh, William was born in Islington um, in May of 1878, and he was the son of, of a scaffolder. Um, he had a, a younger sister born a little while after him, and after that, just a couple of months later, unfortunately, their mother passed away. But their father remarried. Uh, in fact, he went on to have three subsequent marriages, and, had, and uh, William had as many as 20 half-brothers or sisters um, afterwards. He was sent away when he was quite young, though, following the death of his mother, and he went to his father's village of Silso in Bedfordshire, where he lived with his uncle. He had a cousin who was about the same age, and they, must have, they lived together and went to school um, together there. And uh, William was baptised in the parish church um, up, at, up at Silso. And when he grew up, um, he came down to... Sorry, he came to Chipstead. And when he was about 19 or 20 years old, um, he was living in Elmore Cottages, which was just up by the pond, um, up on the Chipstead High Road. He was working as a gardener, um, at Elmore, um, one of the large houses in the area. We commemorated um, Arthur Norris back in February. Um, he was just a couple of mansions along uh, from, from where William was working. So William was working as a gardener there, but also working in the house uh, was Charlotte Parsons, um, a young um, housemaid. And they <coughs> married soon afterwards uh, in 1905 at St. Margaret's Church, and they had a, a son, William, uh, in 1906. Um, one of the interesting things about Chipstead for me, uh, from a research point of view, is despite the fact that it's a lot smaller than Banstead, it seems to have more notable families per head than Banstead did. And so virtually everything that ever happened in Chipstead is reported in the local paper. And so we know that William uh, played cricket for Chipstead. His first appearance for them was in uh, 1899. He played many matches for them, uh, more a bowler than a batter. Um, he played every year in the annual uh, Chipstead single versus Chipstead married uh, matches. When he got married in 1905, he had to, had to switch teams. And uh, their village cricket team uh, was much smaller than Banstead, so they didn't have a, a first 11 for the, the local gentry and a second 11 for the working men. And the two, uh, the two halves of the village um, mingled together. Um, he used to drink at the Star um, in, down at Hooley, and he was a member of the, the Slate Club. Um, there. They were uh, a friendly society, not as organised as, as, as the big organisations like uh, the Odd Fellows, for example, but just um, most pubs would have a slate behind the bar uh, and people would pay in uh, to a hardship fund uh, or a sick relief fund and, uh, uh, over the course of the year. And if they should become um, ill or unemployed or what have you, uh, then they'd pay out. And at the end of the year, the, the members of the Slate Club would get together uh, and they distribute the balance of uh, the fund back, back to their members. Uh, it was a good way for people to, to afford a, a kind of basic insurance and also to save money, put money aside for things like Christmas presents, for example. Um, and he's, he was a member of the Slate Club there. And in 1902, at their first ever uh, monthly smoking concert, uh, uh, a much more relaxed rather than a formal concert where the men could sit and, and smoke, um, he contributed a comic song, um, I Wish There Were No Prisons, and uh, various members of the, of the club uh, contributed with other songs and sketches and speeches uh, at that event. They moved to uh, Burheath in about 1909, and they uh, came to live at Can Hatch Cottage. Now, Can Hatch uh, was a large mansion that used to stand um, at the junction of the Brighton Road and Cannons Lane. There's a modern road called Can Hatch um, there today. And there are three houses there, and the first house in that road is roughly where, where the big house was. Uh, Can Hatch and Cannons Lane got their name uh, from a rectory um, that was uh, a medieval rectory that belonged to the August Augustinian Canons, um, which is somewhere down near Cannons Farm. Uh, and it was called Can Hatch because the hatch was the gate to the lane used by the Canons, which is where the Can Park comes from. He was working there um, as a chauffeur. He'd started out as a gardener, he'd become an electrician. Uh, and he then changed career once more to become a chauffeur mechanic. And he was driving for Captain Taylor, uh, who lived in that house. He was only there for a couple of years. In about 1913, uh, uh, two of Captain Taylor's um, staff uh, 
female staff were, were cycling home uh, from Sutton um, when they were struck by a car. And I do wonder if that put the tailors off car ownership because it was about that time uh, that William left. And he went just over the road to Cold Blow. Um, now, as you go from Banstead towards the Heath and you pass uh, Aberdour on your left, you climb up a hill. And that was in the old days known as Cold Blow Hill because it was cold and the wind blew quite a lot. Uh, and on the right as you go up there, um, there's uh, a road called Ruffitt's Way, which is just on the top of the hill. And that's roughly where, where Cold Blow was. It was originally the home of uh, Sir Edward Howarth, who commanded the artillery um, at Talavera. And there's actually a memorial plaque to him uh, in the bell tower here. Um, but it was owned by a stockbroker at the time uh, William went there to, to drive for him. They didn't have uh, a cottage of their own on the grounds uh, for, for the chauffeur to live in. So um, the, the Gudgeons went to live at number eight Cannons Lane, which is now number 16. Um, at the time, there were only about 10 cottages uh, in Cannons Lane up by the Brighton Road um, end on the southern side of the road. They'd only just been built. They were quite modern. Uh, and the rent would have been something like two pounds a year um, for those cottages. They had a couple more boys, a couple more sons uh, there in 1909, and then again, uh, sorry, 1914, and then um, he was uh, baptised at St Mary's, uh, one of the earliest baptisms to happen um, at that church, uh, and uh, in May 1914. Uh, and then uh, slightly later on, they had a, a, a third son, Oswald, who was also uh, baptised at St Mary's. In 1915, December 1915, William joined the army under the Derby scheme. Uh, and as a driver, he would have been headhunted by the Army Service Corps uh, to drive, drive lorries, uh, mostly. They were considered to be skilled uh, men. They were given uh, good pay, uh, good benefits. Uh, there was a, a hard-fought advertising campaign to persuade um, chauffeurs to, to join up, emphasising the benefits, the fact that the women loved drivers, uh, that they were safe far from the, the front lines. Uh, in fact, we've commemorated you know, a few drivers, a few people in the Army Service Corps. It's almost as if the War Department were lying to the men about the safety um, aspect. And <coughs> the, um, the owners of motor cars, the people that own the big houses, were persuaded to let their men go to the front uh, to train up elderly footmen to, to replace their chauffeurs and guarantee the men's jobs for when they returned. And William joined up uh, in December of 1915 with the Army Service Corps. Uh, and he deferred his service um, under the Derby scheme. You were allowed to choose or to either join the army straight away um, or wait until all, your men were, all the men were called up. Uh, William chose to wait, and he was called up with all the married men uh, in June of 1916. He went off to train at one of the Army Service Corps depots, probably Grove, Grove Park or Osterley Park um, in London. And a few months later, their third son, uh, Oswald, was born. Uh, when he was baptised at St Mary's, uh, William's occupation was listed as soldier. We don't know if he was present uh, at the time, but he would probably have still been local So, if he was in London, so maybe he was able to attend. Uh, he went to uh, Bulford camp um, on Salisbury Plain um, very early in 1917 and joined the 906th Mechanical Transport Company. Um, they were uh, soon to be converted into uh, the 52nd Auxiliary Petrol Company. Uh, and they drove petrol engine lorries, hence the name, rather than diesels. Uh, they were American uh, peerless four-ton uh, lorries, and they had 75, probably, in their company, um, organised into five sections of 15 lorries. Each section had uh, motorbikes and uh, workshop trucks as well. Uh, and they were destined uh, to, to sail... Um, east to Egypt um, to join the campaign um, to uh, uh, invade or liberate Syria and Palestine from the Ottoman Empire. So in um, late April 1917, uh, the lorries were packed up um, onto various different ships and they're sent off to, to Egypt. And the men sailed for France. They had a journey uh, from the northern French uh, channel ports down to Marseille. They lasted three or four nights, only moving at night time so the Germans didn't know uh, what the troop movements were. Uh, it was quite an uncomfortable and slow journey. Uh, and they went into camp at Marseille when they arrived. Now, on the evening um, of the 3rd of May, uh, a, a glorious evening with the sun uh, shining on, on a blue ocean uh, and glinting off the, the golden statue of the Madonna and Child on the Church of Notre Dame, um, just above the hill, just on the hills above Marseille. 
Uh, they boarded the transport, but they had plenty of space. Every man had a berth, and they were very comfortable. It was a luxury cruise by the standards um, of troop ships. And they sailed uh, that evening uh, to sail through the Mediterranean for uh, Alexandria. Now, when they got aboard, um, rather than assign men to lifeboats and life rafts as soon as they arrived aboard, um, instead they decided that they were going to do it the following morning, uh, at morning parade. They'd just blown the whistle to call the men up to deck um, for morning parade, uh, 10 o'clock on the 4th of May, uh, when suddenly a torpedo track was seen uh, in the water. It seemed to one of the men who saw it to be moving extremely slowly, and he watched it for 300 yards until it struck the uh, stern of the ship and hit the port's engine room. It burst through the coal bunkers, uh, making a, a hole the size of a tram uh, in the side, killing several of the stokers instantly. Immediately, they shut the watertight doors. The ship was taking on water, but they thought they might have about three hours uh, to evacuate. As the men hadn't yet been allocated to lifeboats and life rafts, and there were 50 lifeboats and 40 life rafts, it should have been plenty uh, for all the men aboard, um, there was a, a scramble to, to work out who needed to go where uh, to get on board um, these boats and off the ship. Uh, officers fired their pistols in the air to maintain order. Uh, and, and a sense of calm uh, did pervade um, in the end. In fact, the ship's crew were shouted themselves hoarse to get the men to hurry up because they were being too they believed too orderly. Um, as the ship began to list, it became very difficult to get the lifeboats down into the water because of the angle, and several of them uh, tipped over as they went down, uh, spilling the men out and into the sea. But each man had already been issued with a lifeboat, and they'd been, told, they'd been told at breakfast time that they were to keep them on all day, and many, many lives were saved because of that order. A shout went up to get the women off first. There were about 66 uh, Red Cross nurses aboard, and they were uh, lined up uh, calmly on deck, waiting for a lifeboat, and they were among the first two boats that were lowered away. And they were pulling away from the ship uh, just about 15 minutes, 20 minutes after that first torpedo strike, when a second torpedo uh, was seen in the water. Now, the Transylvania had been escorted by two Japanese uh, destroyers, the Matsu and the Sakaki, and the Japanese had uh, fought, on, fought on our side during the First World War. Uh, they'd entered the war uh, with quite an opportunist, opportunistic eye uh, on German territories in the Pacific. And most of the belligerent nations had some sort of territorial objectives in mind uh, when they made up uh, their minds uh, which side it was they were going to declare for. And the Japanese had long been allies of the British, um, but they just, and they decided to come into the war um, on, on our side uh, in order to take possession of the German settlements of Qingdao uh, in China and also the Marshall Islands and a couple of other Pacific possessions. Uh, and they had provided a, a fleet of, um, of destroyers to escort um, British ships through the Mediterranean. Uh, and they, escort, they did something like 400 escort sorties um, throughout the war, and they uh, shepherded about 700,000 men backwards and forwards between uh, Europe and Africa uh, and Greece. The two ships that were circling, one of them, the Matsu, came in to take off um, men from the Transylvania, while the Sakaki um, sailed around uh, to try and locate the submarine, uh, make sure it couldn't get its periscope up and get that second shot away, but it had got that second shot away. It was aiming actually for the Matsu, the, the Japanese destroyer that was taking off the men. The Matsu saw it and they put their engines full astern and they pulled out of the way in time. But unfortunately, the torpedo then struck the Transylvania. It struck it amidships, and the ship began to then very rapidly sink. And the men hurried as best they could to get on board uh, those life rafts. According to some stories, there were still men waiting on the deck calmly, uh, even singing a song, uh, while others jumped into the water. The second Japanese destroyer, the Sakaki, in a, in a feat of bold seamanship, came under the front of the ship, smashing its own lifeboats as it did so getting as close as it possibly could so that the men on the front of the ship could jump off. And they timed their jump, waiting for the swell of the sea to lift the smaller, lighter Japanese ship up towards the, um, the uh, Transylvania so they'd ha only have a short drop to make. And hundreds of men got off the ship in that way. As I said, the ship was by now sinking quite rapidly. Uh, and about 40 minutes after that first torpedo strike, it went down. Not all the men had got off the ship, there were many drowned. The Japanese rescued 
hundreds, thousands of men from the ship that day. Many more were in the water in the lifeboats, uh, on life rafts, clinging to mess tables and all sorts of, all sorts of debris. Uh, fishermen from the um, nearby fishing village of Savona in Italy uh, came out to, to, into a sea that was beginning to become rough. Uh, a gale was beginning to blow. They came out to sea to rescue the men, tow lifeboats back into shore. And most of the, most of the men and women that were on board uh, were rescued. Uh, the Red Cross nurses were rescued in the end. They were up to their necks in water by that point, and they were bailing their boat out with their hats. Uh, but they were all picked up safe and sound. William was one of the men that uh, was lost at sea uh, that day. He was drowned. Um, there are about 400 men commemorated whose bodies have never been found, uh, commemorated on the Savona Memorial in Italy. Uh, and William is one of them. There are many more buried in, in graveyards in Italy and as far afield as, as France and Monaco and Spain where their bodies uh, were later washed up by the tides. Uh, William was 38, very nearly 39, left a widow and uh, three young children. Um, he's commemorated here on the panels uh, in the corner of the church and at uh, St Mary's and the Burheath War Memorial Hall uh, and also in his parish church at Silso in Bedfordshire and on their memorial um, in the village of Silso. Now, uh, as we don't have any relatives um, at all, Anne, would you like to toll the bell for William? So if you're able...